everybody to Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman, Montana. We are so happy you're here for today's program on Paleozoic Sea Creatures. My name is Angie and I'll be your host for today's program and I'm with paleontologist Lee Hall. In Hi. just a minute we're going to get started and let Lee share all the wonderful um, objects that he has for us today. But before we do, I just want to invite you to type into the chat box which grade you're in and where you're tuning in from. We'd love to, to hear where you're all coming from today. Our program's about 35 minutes long, um, and with that, we'll get started. Lee, thanks so much for being here. Thanks, Angie. Uh, hello to all of our viewers from across Montana and abroad. My name is Lee, and I'm really excited today because we're going to talk about some of the weirdest and coolest fossils that are, that are out there. We're going to talk about Paleozoic uh, sea life, and so what we'll come away with today, hopefully, is an understanding of how diverse the oceans have been throughout Earth's history. And I hope that you learned some cool things that maybe you didn't know before about the ancient oceans that once covered the Earth. And, you know, we'll look at Montana specifically, too. So welcome to Paleozoic Sea Creatures. We are streaming to you live from the Museum of the Rockies. That's right down here in Bozeman, Montana. Now, the Museum of the Rockies is known for dinosaurs, and I sure love dinosaurs, but today we're going to be talking about fossils that are far more ancient than the dinosaurs. A little bit about me. My name is Lee. I'm the paleontology field professional here at Museum of the Rockies. I spend a lot of time digging up dinosaurs, but in the past I have worked with some Paleozoic fossil fish, which we will talk about a little later, Dunkleosteus in particular there. Now, I think some people may know at least one make-believe Paleozoic monster. If you've ever heard of the creature from the Black Lagoon, one of the original universal monsters uh, from the 1950s, this movie came out uh, and it was a big deal because they had 3D and it was one of the first movies where they could record people diving under the water with underwater cameras. So there was a lot of footage of swimming around and the creature chasing people. But uh, uh, what I've brought in with me today is a, a model of a, of a prop from the film. This is the fossilized hand of the creature from the Black Lagoon, which is supposedly found in the Devonian rocks of the Amazon rainforest basin in the movie. Now, some adaptations in the creature's hand. You can see it's got little fins between the fingers here. It's It's got claws in the end. It's very big and scary. So, you know, it can grab people by the face and they can go, oh, the creature got me. But in this case, we're going to look at animals before, before there was anything with five fingers like this, before anything that looked remotely human. But I think that's just a fun way to start talking about the Paleozoic. So, that's not a real fossil, is it, Lee? This, well, no, this is my, this is not a real fossil. This is my, um, this is my model that I made. So, um, it's made out of resin. That's why I can, you know, be silly with it. All right. So let's look at Montana today and let's talk about, you know, the landscape. So if you're out West here, you're going to be in the foothills of the Rocky mountains or in the mountain valleys themselves. Uh, if you're out east, you're going to be out in the Greater Plains area, and you'll have those beautiful rolling hills of prairie and farm fields and ranch land. But if you go back in time 400 million years ago, for example, Montana would have looked like this. And as you can see there, there aren't any cows, there aren't any ravens, um, no mountains. It's It's a sea, it's a seabed full of squid and fish and corals and snails and sea lilies well how do we how do we connect montana then to montana today how does that work well you can start by going to a mountain and here in bozeman we have the, the big uh, montana state m on the side of the bridger mountains there and if you hike up past the m a little bit there's a limestone ridge about 6,700 feet above sea level. And when you're up on that limestone ridge looking out over the valley, Gallatin Valley, you'll find these odd little objects here just sticking out of the limestone. And they're sort of circular. They kind of look like a bicycle wheel when you see them end on. Uh, but if you find one that's eroded out of the stone completely, it'll look kind of like a claw or a horn 
well, it's actually a kind of coral. It's a horn coral. And that spoky wheel end is where the little coral animal would have lived. So in life, that is what those corals would have looked like. So the question is, how do you get a reef, a coral reef, a tropical ocean reef at the top of a mountain or making up whole mountains in Montana? So let's look at a map of Montana. And if we look at the uh, rocks, you can see that those colors map out where Paleozoic aged rocks are. Now, a whole bunch of the land out in eastern Montana is from the age of dinosaurs. That's where the rocks there are, are dated back to. But in a lot of the mountaintops, you get these super ancient Paleozoic rocks. And that is where we tend to find those corals and fossils of ancient squids and fish. So, so how does the sea go from being at the sea up into the, into the mountains? So it starts with a little bit of geology. And basically, there's always sediment and particles of rock and dirt that rivers are carrying out into the ocean. And that dirt and that sediment settles down onto the seabed and it piles up and it forms layers. So depending on if it's sand or mud, you get sandstone or shale. And as that piles up, it uh, compresses into rock. Now, plate tectonics are always in motion. So the plates are always moving and heaving and there's earthquakes and as plates crunch together, it pushes the layers of rock up. And so it can actually take the seabed and lift it up out of uh, uh, higher up into elevation. And as it does that, it also erodes away. And what that gives you is seabed rocks that eventually get pushed up and uh, form mountain ranges. And this is a lot like if you take a piece of paper and put your hands on either side and then try to bring your hands together, the paper will rise up and buckle like, like rocks uh, do to make mountain ranges. And so if you walk onto the surface of the ground or up on the, on the peaks or hi go hiking, uh, the ground you're walking across once upon a time was the mud at the bottom of an ocean. And it takes a long time for that mud to turn into rock and then get pushed up and heaved up into mountain ranges. So the Paleozoic was a long time ago. These are the layers of the geologic column, the layers of rock, the layers of time uh, that have fossils in them on planet Earth. And at the very top there is where we are living today in the Anthropocene, but uh, that's present day. And the blue stripes, those are when dinosaurs existed. The Paleozoic is way earlier, about 540 to 250 million years ago, give or take. And it's not important to remember the exact numbers and uh, some of the crazy names you're going to hear. We just want to kind of pay attention to the overall kind of patterns of things happening. And so when we look at the Earth today, that is the globe. So if we're out in space looking at the equator, we can see planet Earth and we can see the Montana marked with a little red marker up there at the top of the north end. Well, let's go back in time 100 million years. Let's use geology and wind back the clock. OK, so this is when dinosaurs are hanging out. Uh, it still looks pretty recognizable. You know, the continent of North America has been flooded and the um, uh, uh, continents are still kind of in a familiar position. But as we go back in time, 200 million, 300 million, there you can see we're in the Paleozoic and Montana and much of North America is flooded with seawater 400 million years ago, same thing, 500 million years ago, still flooded. So North America for several hundred million years was flooded by seawater. So there's a lot of Paleozoic fossils to be found out here. And at this time, at 500 million years ago, we're going to start our journey back to the present. And we're going to start in the weirdest of weird times. This is the Cambrian. And the Cambrian is the very first period of the Paleozoic and has some of the kookiest, oddest animal fossils that, that you can find. Starting with Anomalocaris. So this, this animal was basically like a big, flat, kind of swimming, lobstery thing. And it, it floated through the water and it used these long 
big kind of grabber mandible things at the front of its face to scoop up little sea crustaceans like trilobites. Uh, and it also hunted Pekaya. Pekaya, this little kind of fluky, wormy looking translucent fellow, is actually an early, early relative of the vertebrates or the animals with backbones. At this point in time, skeletons, internal skeletons didn't exist. They hadn't evolved yet. So everything had an exoskeleton. But Pekaya was a soft bodied animal that just showed the earliest traces of maybe having something kind of like a kind of like a spinal cord. So this is an early, super early cousin of you and me and every other animal with a backbone. There are also weird things like opabinia. That, I mean, a predatory arthropod, it's about as good as an explanation you could get. It's related to things, other arthropods of today, like insects or crabs and lobsters. It, used, it had five eyes and it used that uh, long proboscis at the front of its face probably we think to reach into worm burrows and pluck juicy little worms out of the sea mud. And of course they were living in environments with sponges and algae. Uh, there were little crustaceans like Canadaspis, which would have crawled around looking for little worms and things. Burgessicata is a burrowing worm and that would have lived in the seabed and would have plucked stray little bugs coming across and uh, made a meal out of them. And then there were other weird animals like Wilwaxia, which was kind of like if you gave a slug a coat of armor uh, made of fingernails. There isn't really anything much like that today. Uh, Hallucigenia is a weird worm-like animal that had little spikes coming out of its back and little, little long tube feet it could use to walk across the seabed. Many of the things in the Cambrian time uh, you know, were, were weird because it's so long ago that nothing really had evolved that we're familiar with. Although some of these might look familiar, like little Canadaspis down there and Olenoides, which is a trilobite. Uh, so actually trilobites are among the most common fossils that you can find from the Paleozoic. And I have some examples here. So trilobites are really cute. Most of them are not too much bigger than maybe a quarter uh, or a business card. But as you can see here, Here's a nice little trilobite from Utah, Asophiscus, and it's dark. It's hard to see. And a lot of the fossils from the Paleozoic kind of look like dark smears on dark gray shale. So this rock would have been the mud at the bottom of the sea, and this trilobite died and was buried in the mud. So this would have been sort of like the seabed, and then the mud would have settled down on top of this little guy. And uh, there you can see it's buried. There's actually another tiny little trilobite cousin right there. That's really hard to see, but these sea muds are, are full of little trilobites. And I want to show you something about trilobites and why they have their name using this big model of a isotelus. So this is my big model of isotelus, the trilobite. You can see the eyes up here at the top of the head, these two bumps, one, two. Now it's trilobite. It means three lobes or three lumps and I think if you look at the body, you can see why it might be called a trilobite, because there's one, two, three lobes or lumps that make up most of the body. And if you want to know some other fancy names, the head is called the cephalon, the body is called the thorax, and then the little trilobite butt is called the pygidium, or the little, little tail. So there, now you're all trilobite experts. So trilobites, they got their start in the Cambrian, and they're around up all through the Paleozoic, and uh, they went extinct uh, before the dinosaurs were around, unfortunately. But uh, um, they're, again, very, very common fossils. Now we're going to jump ahead out of the Cambrian into the Devonian. So we're going to skip some time, and we're going to see some things that are much more familiar. So between the Cambrian and the Devonian, fish evolved. The first animals with internal skeletons, our ancient ancestors, things with jaws got going. And the uh, invertebrates, or animals without backbones, diversified as well. And the Devonian is so cool because they call it the Age of Fishes. And that's where some of the really coolest sea monster-like animals that ever lived uh, came into being, like Dunkleosteus, which we'll talk about in a moment. But here you can see a Devonian reef, and there are corals, there are sea sponges, and then there are these really cool long shelled squids that have long shells and um, sea lilies, crinoids, which we'll show you in a second. So these reefs were full of diversity. You had 
uh, our horn corals, which are down in the bottom. And I can show you here uh, the size of a horn coral. They're not very big. They're about the size of a finger. But I'll come around. So the, yeah, so here's the horn coral in my hand. I'm trying to get, there we go. We've got focus there. So it's only about this long here. I'm holding the base and it flared up like a cone and the animal, the coral polyp would have lived in the top chamber of this little structure. And that's where it had its little tendrils. So if you can imagine you trying to reach into a, a bag of cereal trying to get cereal to eat. That's kind of what corals do with their polyps. Their polyps are like little fingers that grab little bits of food out of the water and pull it down into the mouth. Kind of like a Sarlacc from Star Wars, if you like Star Wars. Um, and so that's where you can find a lot of common uh, fossils in, in coral as well. So there were little coiled shelled squids, kind of like of uh, the, you see platyclamenia, and I actually have a coiled shell model of a little coiled shell squid here. Their later relatives, they survived uh, up until the age of dinosaurs, the ammonites. So you can see this is a spiral, and as they grow uh, from babies to adults, they add a living chamber. The animal only lives at the very end of the shell, and as it grows, the shell just gets bigger and bigger as the animal gets bigger, but it only lives in the very front part of the shell. So then they would have blooped their way through the water uh, looking for little fish and things to capture and eat. So the other animals living on the seabed were things like crinoids. So if you've ever seen a sea urchin, a crinoid is related to a sea urchin. The animal is actually, it lives on a big stalk that it grows. And the stalks, is, it's kind of like a stack of coins. You have these little disks that when they're put together, they make a long kind of a trunk. And the animal lives in this kind of a lump at the top of the stalk called a calyx. And there are these feathery arms that reach out into the water. And those little tendrils in the arms gather bits of food and bring them down towards the mouth that's in that lump called the calyx. And that's it. That's, that's how the animal lives. And so there are some really beautiful crinoid or sea lily fossils that you can see uh, at a lot of museums. But my favorite paleozoic fossil is this big beastie fish, Dunkleosteus. So this is the skull. Dunkleosteus belonged to a group of fish called uh, armored fish because they had very thick skull bones. This, those bones were not external, but, but they were thick enough. That's why they have the nickname. And Dunkleosteus was like the great white shark of the Devonian. It was the biggest meat-eating thing swimming around in, on the planet. And it liked to eat little sharks and, and other bony fish, uh, anything it could get its mouth around. And I actually have a model of Dunkleosteus here. And I love this model because I can show people how Dunkleosteus could jump. So this is the business end here. And I like this model because I can, I can basically put you, if you're a fish and you see this coming towards you, you're gonna have a bad day. Look out, oh no. So Dunkleosteus had very strong jaws, 700 newtons of force, so several thousand pounds of pressure. Uh, it could basically bite through a car, no problem, with those big bony chomping uh, shears and its uh, the blades on its jaws. So even if you're the titan king queen of the ocean like Dunkleosteus, when you die and your body sinks to the seabed, there's all kinds of invertebrates there waiting to gobble up your soft tissue. So snails, like Trapetocyclus uh, there, or sea scorpions. So sea scorpions or Eurypterids um, evolved in the Paleozoic, and some of them could be very big. Some of them were about the size of what you'd expect a modern land scorpion to be, but some of them could be even bigger than a human, you know, seven, eight feet long. And if you'll see, the sea scorpion has a flat kind of rectangular broad nose, and it's got these long paddle-like arms sticking out the side. And I'm gonna show you a fossil of a sea scorpion so that you can understand why it's so tricky sometimes to study these. But here is a sea scorpion fossil, okay? And <clears throat> what you're looking at here is, there's the snout, there's that rounded snout, and then there are a couple of little bumps that are hard to see, but there's one there and one there, those are where the eyes would be. And then this is just one part of one of those little paddles, one of those arms, and there should be another one over there. But this is this is a 
what we'd call kind of a poorly preserved fossil of a sea scorpion. But you can see it's thin, it's flat, because when you're a sea bug and you die and you get squished, there's no nothing inside to basically keep you from from getting flattened like a like a cardboard box under the wheel of a truck. You just get kind of squished flat and buried. But there are many, many well-preserved fossils of sea scorpions. So we know a lot about what they look like in their anatomy because uh, there are some beautiful examples where you can see everything in the fossil really clearly. Now, we're gonna jump forward in time again after the Devonian. So Dunkleosteus, unfortunately, is extinct now. Um, and we are going to uh, end in the Pennsylvanian. So almost the end of the Paleozoic. And the Pennsylvanian is when we had lots of really, really cool things happening. On the land, there were giant forests, there were millipedes that were longer than a person, dragonflies the size of a raven, uh, giant forests covered the land. But in the ocean, the fishes had expanded in diversity, sharks now were taking over the water, and you had a whole bunch of really crazy looking fish unlike anything today. And a great place to find these fossils is actually in central Montana in the Bear Gulch limestone. So this is southeast of Livingston. And when you see the fossil deposits, those cliffs of gray uh, shale and uh, uh, siltstone, those are all those layers uh, are layers of the seabed. So those were all the surface of the seabed at one point. So when animals died, they sank on there. And the sediment the particles in the rock is very fine, almost like a, a flower. And because of that, it took very good detailed impressions of the animals when they were buried. So it preserves things like, yes, bones and shells, but also skin and soft tissue, which is very rare. So the Barragulch limestone is a wonderful fossil deposit. And here we have uh, examples of animals known like Stephacanthus, see, even a professional paleontologist has trouble with these names, so don't feel bad for yourself. Stephacanthus, <laughs> I said it right earlier, Stephacanthus was a shark. The males had this weird dorsal bristly comb thing on top of their heads, uh, and we're not sure what that was used for. The females didn't have it, so it must have been something where you know, maybe the males were showing off to the females, maybe the males, you know, bumped in and said hello with it, or maybe they fought with each other, but it's kind of hard to answer those kinds of questions. Um, you also have falchitis, which was a shark with kind of a long javelin spine in front of its head, and then a chimera. Now, we still have sharks, and we actually still have chimera. They're closely related. They're both within a larger group of fish that don't have bony skeletons, but cartilage skeletons. And chimera include modern living animals like ratfish. So you should look those up if you want to see some pictures of living descendants of that group of fish. Uh, but definitely some of the weirdest looking fish that I have ever seen come from the Barragulch limestone. Falcatus. Before you move yeah. on, speaking of Barragulch limestone, this is a timely question. Um, what percent of the sea fossils from Montana were found in that limestone? Oh, that is a really good question. And I don't know the answer to that because you have to think that anytime somebody's out hiking and spots a piece of a horn coral, that's technically a sea fossil from Montana. And there are millions of horn corals eroding out of the mountains everywhere. So percentage would be very difficult. However, if we look at our map, the Bear Gulch limestone is basically where that star is. And it's not the whole area, it's just a part of the area under that star. All those other colors are not the Bear Gulch limestone. So just geologically speaking, there's much less of an of a, a area to find fossils from the Bear Gulch. So you're going to find far fewer there because there's just less of that rock. It's a very, very minimalized, localized deposit. So it's kind of like, like your Neapolitan ice cream. You know, you've got strawberry chocolate and vanilla and everyone always goes after the chocolate, you know, that's that's sort of the same deal, you know, your bear gulch is maybe your chocolate, and uh, once, it's, once it's out, it's out, that's all there is. Okay, 
So there's a picture, better picture of Falcatus, the shark with a little pokey head spine on the males. And we also move from open water into the reeds and the kelp of Gildiacthes is a ray fin fish. So similar to what you'd see in modern reef settings, uh, it's a very tall, very skinny fish. Side to side is very narrow because that helps it move through all the big strands of kelp and seaweed, okay? That helps it basically live in, in that habitat and swim around. Uh, at the seabed, we have things like horseshoe crabs, which are still living today. Uh, and then Alanipterus, there's a coelacanth, and a coelacanth is actually, we have a modern uh, a relative a cousin of these kinds of fish that uh, are still alive and well today off the coast of South Africa. And then there were some fish that would have lived in little burrows in the mud, like Aphalodotus. So it's kind of a long eelish looking fish that uh, only kind of looks like eels. That's not actually a true eel, but that's not important. It just kind of hung out in the mud and would have uh, picked food as, as, you know, as it poked its head out of its burrow, the little fish and bugs and things swam by it would have eaten them. Then there's also another chimera, Traquarius, which has these crazy weird spines. Don't, I, I do not, have no idea what on earth those would have functioned for. It's just so bizarre and so cool, but it's uh, only part of one because it's obviously a carcass and there are a couple of mantis shrimp that are investigating and eating. And I actually have models here in the studio of Tyrannophontes and Perimicterus. So these are life-sized, and I've got my little thing here. They're very delicate, so I have them on my little magnifier stand. All right, so here is Tyrannoniptes, and if you look, oh, there, oh, ooh, perfect. So you can see how the claws at the front of, of the body, they kind of look like they point forward, they scoop forward because these are little raptorial claws. So they would have been good for reaching out and grabbing prey animals and bringing them into the mouth where they get torn apart and gobbled up. And uh, so the other animal is, uh, Paramectorus is a different kind of mantis shrimp relative. As you can see, it doesn't have those big raptorial claws. It's more flat. This is a more of a kind of a bottom crawler scavenger uh, type of shrimp. And what is it scavenging or eating on the seabed? Well, if a carcass falls down, it's going to eat that. But uh, turns turns out there's a lot of nutrients in fish poop. And so when animals release excrement and settles onto the seabed, there's still a lot of nutrients in there that these little sea bugs like to like to gobble gobble up. It's an easy meal. You know, it's like McDonald's dropping from the sky for these guys. Um, so there are many, many different types of animals living uh, in, in this ocean setting. And uh, also living up in the kelp would have been other kinds of shrimp, as you can see there, Enigma caris, and uh, also relatives of the modern Nautilus. So Tylonautilus there, we still have one species or one genus of coiled squid-like animal or cephalopod, the Nautilus are alive today. And this is a, a relative that we find here in Montana, which is pretty wild. So yeah, these fossils tell us that once upon a time, Montana would have been an ancient saltwater bay or estuary along the coast, of uh, the interior coast of North America. And we have an amazing fossil record here. So uh, what I want you all to take away from this is, you know, our fossil record tells us the earth and its oceans have always been a very, very diverse, place. As soon as life got a hold and uh, started to take off here on planet Earth, things got crazy and interesting really fast from, you know, the Cambrian explosion with anomalous Caris and Opabinia and all those weird critters uh, to when we got backbones on Earth and the fish evolved and fish like Dunkleosteus were swimming around and chomping on other, other fish and anything it could get its mouth around to. Uh, you know, the Bear Gulch Bay, where we had crazy sharks and chimera and all kinds of cool little mantis shrimp. Uh, you know, Earth's oceans have always been diverse and they're always healthy when they're diverse, which is why it's important that we take care of our oceans today. Because as you'll see, you know, nothing lasts forever on planet Earth, but we need to try and maintain our diversity in our oceans because you can't get animals back after they're gone. You know, we can't get Dunkleosteus back. We can't get Anomalocaris back. 
You know, we can't get the sea scorpions back, whether you like them or think they're creepy. You know, they have served important roles in their ecosystems. So it's really important that we take care of our and preserve our modern biodiversity, because that is when the environment is healthiest and a healthy environment is good for us human beings. So with that, I want to thank you all so much for being a wonderful audience today. And if you have questions, please email us at moroutreach at montana.edu. We'll leave the email address up there for you. And we are happy to take some questions. Yeah, we have quite a few, Lee. So um, the first one, um, Dunkleosius, I have a hard time with that name too. So um, was that model to scale? And then can you tell us um, how big that creature was compared to a great white shark? So my little model here is probably like a hatchling or a, ba a baby Dunkleosteus size. Uh, and I've seen fossils where this is probably about the size of a newborn Dunkleosteus right here. Uh, well, they would have grown to be larger than a great white shark. Their skulls could be five or six feet long. So you're looking at a 25 foot long fish, possibly 30 maybe, but we, we've never found a whole one. So we don't know exactly how long they could get completely, but they were gigantic. And they, you, it's not anything you would have wanted to see swimming around you for sure. Uh, we have a question about Megalodon. Did Megalodon live in the Paleozoic? No, actually Megalodon, a lot of times people think maybe it lived with the dinosaurs because everything big seems to have lived with the dinosaurs or maybe the Paleozoic because of all these sharks. But Megalodon, actually lived fairly recently up until about two and a half million years ago and it went extinct. Megalodon was far more recent. Uh, it was the largest shark that ever ever evolved. It got, got up to, to 50 feet long or more. Uh, it was a whale eating giant mega shark. And uh, we know it went extinct because uh, ecologically and physiologically, it could only live and exist up in the upper surface of the ocean. And when it, when it had babies, they would swim into shallow bays along the coast and the babies would start life out there before growing large enough to swim out into the ocean. Uh, they could not have survived uh, at depth living in the bottom of the ocean, you know, like some of the movies say. Uh, if Megalodon were still alive, we'd be finding whale carcasses with giant pieces missing and giant shark teeth stuck in them. So we know that they are extinct uh, and they only lived very recently compared to the Paleozoic. Great. We saw a lot of great sea creatures today and you showed us some examples of fossils. Were they all from Montana and the Wyoming area? So some of these were, um, some of them are not. So the fossil examples of the, uh, of the little mantis shrimp from Bear Gulch uh, those are from Montana. Dunkleosteus fossils are fairly rare, and they come from generally either uh, northern Ohio or they come from Morocco. Those are really the only places where you find very good Dunkleosteus fossils. The trilobites and the eurypterid, the trilobites came from Utah. The eurypterid, I think, is from New York. And that's pretty typical when you start talking about fossil uh, animals. When you're talking about this much time, uh, you know, not every state or every continent has rocks of, of all geologic ages in one place. And so what we know about animals and what, from their fossils comes from um, specimens we've collected from different continents and from research done on different fossil deposits. There's only one Bear Gulch limestone, for example. Um, but, you know, on the contrast to that, there's, there's only one um, Cambrian uh, Burgess Shale deposit up in Canada. So what we do is we stitch together the knowledge of the entire geologic and paleontological history of the earth using fossil deposits of, of different ages uh, from around the world and kind of putting that picture together. So uh, yes, a little of some from here and some from there. Great, and you just kind of talked about this, but how do we know how old these fossils are? So we actually, when we go to date fossils, a lot of people hear the term carbon dating um, and think that's how it's done, but that's only good for fossils really from the ice age or younger than 100,000 years. And that's where you actually use a piece of the fossil bone or shell to, to check its age using uh, carbon-14 and radiometric decay. And without getting very technical, generally when it comes to things that are older than that, we actually use the rocks around the fossil. And it's sort of it's sort of like um, 
how you could date a book by looking at the at the copyright inside. Maybe you you to to find out how the uh, you know when the book was printed. Well, for fossils, what happens is we can't really find out the age of a specific say trilobite, but the rocks around the trilobites uh, and fossils in general will often contain volcanic ash. So in amongst all the beds of, of sea mud or sandstone or wherever you are, sometimes you'll find layers of volcanic ash. And within that volcanic ash are little crystals of a mineral called zircon. And within zircon, there are radioactive elements that uh, like uranium. And uranium uh, is when, when Zircon forms after a volcanic eruption, the uranium inside starts to decay. It's like if you take an ice cube out of the freezer, it starts to melt on the counter. And we know how long it takes for uranium to decay within a zircon crystal. So when you find a fossil deposit and you find a layer of volcanic ash and you look at the uranium in the volcanic ash, you can see how much of it has uh, decayed away versus how much is still there. And the ratio of how much is gone versus how much is left or how much of your ice cube is melted versus how much of your ice cube is still there is like a clock. It tells us how much time has passed. So that's how we know how old so many of these things are. We actually use the ages of radioactive elements within the rocks all around the world and not just uranium. There are many, many different kinds. And I'm sorry if that's getting kind of mush mouth and, and boring, but it's technical. It is really technical, you know, nobody, and it's good that it is because we're sure about it. Nobody's just kind of looking and guessing at anything. We're very sure about these things. One last question for you, Lee. Um, we're here at the Museum of the Rockies. We're in one of our rooms full of fossils and yeah. our collections. How many fossils does Museum of the Rockies have in, in our building? Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, oh boy, is it two? two? 200,000 fossils. Yeah, it's a lot. It's it's a lot of fossils and it's there's, there's a lot of cool ones to look at. That's a good question. Great. All right. Well, everybody, thank you so much for joining us today on behalf of Museum of the Rockies and our partners at Streamable Learning. We hope you had a great time. Send us any questions that we didn't get to at more outreach at montana.edu. Thanks so much for joining us and we hope to see you at our next program. Thank you.